Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings here at the U.S. Naval Institute. We are broadcasting today from the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center from the auditorium stage, which is a great place to be. Uh, today's show is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute since 1873. Now in our 150th year, the members of the Institute have provided the foundation for everything we do, from Proceedings Magazine to Naval History, to our conferences and events, to USNI News, to professional books. The members of the Naval Institute are responsible for the future of the Naval Institute, the past of the Naval Institute. Join today. Go to usni.org forward slash join. Well, today, uh, in keeping with the June information warfare issue of the Proceedings Magazine, which is uh, our cover created by AI, which is, that's an oh. interesting story, right? Yep. Uh, but our focus for June is information warfare. We had the w information warfare essay contest winners. And so we've got with us uh, as my guest today on the stage is Mr. Chris Cleary. He is the principal advisor for cyber warfare to the Department of the Navy. And Chris graduated from the Naval Academy in 1996. He was a surface warfare officer, then lateraled into intelligence, did a combined uh, active duty and reserve duty 26 years in the Navy. Uh, quite a bit of industry expertise uh, at Verizon, and then uh, most recently at Lidos. In 2019, he became the principal, uh, sorry, the digital, I'm, the, I'm screwing that the, up. The chief information security chief officer. Chief information security officer for the Navy. And then 2020, you moved up to be the principal advisor for cyber uh, cyber affairs for mm -hmm. the Department of the Navy. So big job. Yes. Uh, I'll start with a softball question for you. How do you measure cyber readiness? Yeah, so that's a, that's a tough one. It's one we've been struggling with uh, for a while because there's lots of different metrics in there, right? So we have, you have technical readiness, you have readiness of, let's say, the mission force, uh, readiness of cyber survivability of, of many of our platforms or defense, defense critical infrastructure. So, you know, across the Navy, it's, it's been improving uh, consistently over time, but there are things that we have uh, chosen to take a, a more harder interest in just recently, let's say over the last five or 10 years, defense critical infrastructure would be one of those examples. Uh, I work very closely with the chief information officer, uh, who was Aaron Weiss, who brought me into the organization in 2019. Uh, Ms. Jane Rathbun is the acting chief information officer. I'm very supportive of an initiative that they've been running called Cyber Ready which is really uh, you know, an initiative to sort of begin to move away from the compliance side that we've been doing readiness and sort of think about it more through the lens of we would traditionally look at readiness through the way that we would do it, so it's like sorts, you know, or the way that a commander would look at readiness. War fighting readiness. War fighting readiness. Um, you know, traditionally, when you look at enterprise IT systems, we've always looked at them through the lens of the, the risk management framework, and it's a very prescriptive very you know, labor intensive sort of manual process of getting to a sort of a checklist attitude on the readiness of a variety of things. And the idea is to say, hey, how can we begin to pare that down a little bit and make readiness more of a standard, more of the way that we've traditionally looked at readiness across all the other warfare domains and move a little away from the kind of check the block sort of compliance way they were doing readiness. Yep. Uh, but again, readiness across our force, like I said, is improving. Uh, but it's always something that we got our eye on. Got it. So I was just sort of trying to wrap my head around the scope of your job, yeah. right? And I realized today, you know, uh, as I was thinking about this, so there's, you know, ship readiness. So the systems on board a ship in terms of cyber security, right? You've got things like, you know, the, the Air National Guard uh, uh, Air National Guardsmen up in Massachusetts, yep. you know, Sergeant, I think, Teixeira, right? And that demonstrated on a personal sailor level, soldier, Marine level, uh, you've got cyber security awareness issues and problems and, and concerns. Then you've got the industrial, uh, you know, base, mm -hmm. right? So you've got primes and subprimes and, and tertiary companies that feed in. So there's a lot of attack surfaces out there it's pretty massive. Um, how, how is it going? So coming into the job, uh, you know, you were trying to get your hands around the whole breadth and scope of everything you talked about. Yeah. Uh, I think when we traditionally looked at cybersecurity, we looked at it traditionally through the lens of enterprise IT. Okay. You know, the computer systems that we had, NGEN, endpoints, 
Uh, and we tackled the problem not differently than anybody in industry was going after it, ultimately winding up in sort of the zero trust construct that we're beginning to roll out now, or okay. well into rolling out now is a better way to say it. But that's just our enterprise IT. When you look at what makes the Navy the Navy, or the Department of the Navy the Department of the Navy, we have ships, submarines, aircraft, uh, amphibious units, Marines, and that's the expeditionary uh, visible side of what we do. I mean, right. that's when people think the Navy, they think those platforms. Deployed forces. The deployed forces. And then you have all the auxiliaries that go along with them, the information warfare community, medical, clergy. I mean, we could go on legal, uh, well, you could go on and on with what makes up the Navy. Was well, you start to sort of open the aperture and start of looking outwards, well, uh, that Navy at sea forward deployed is connected to things on the shore. And we have networks and systems that allow those ships to contact and communicate and be con controlled from our maritime operation centers. You have space assets. Um, each of those individual platforms are sort of made up of their own multiple uh, subsystems. You know, when you look at a ship, a ship is a hull mechanical, electrical, combat systems, navigation, aviation. You know, that's all those different things come together to make a combat platform a combat platform. Right. You have the defense critical infrastructure that supports all of that. Uh, water, power, electricity. You have the defense industrial base, which supports that. So, that. so the further you continue to sort of zoom out and look at what the Navy is, it gets more and more complicated. Every one of those areas have their own unique attack surface associated with them. Uh, so as we begin to, as we've traditionally looked at problems, I think in the beginning we looked at, at locking down individual systems or individual networks. Well, the really problem is now is how do I look at that whole infrastructure? That whole thing is uniquely designed to support itself and it's not just that platform at sea. It's the whole, you know, the, the Army likes to call it, you know, the Marines, the tooth to tail ratio. Yeah. You know, for every little platform, if not a little platform, forever our combat force that we project forward is a massive logistics, sustainment, supply, support chain that goes along with it. Each one of those things could degrade its ability to be effective forward if it's aimed at our adversary. Now that we're finding, uh, as we're moving through, uh, looking at warfare through tra traditional kinetic range rings, now you bring cyber into it and you've now opened up the globe. Uh, you've opened up all of that to the adversary to figure out how to manipulate, to engage, to, you know, what we're afraid of, to attack, to, to cause physical effects in that environment. Uh, so the effort that the PCA office has been is more of a, I'll call it a campaigning effort within the secretary, within working through the OPNAV staff, N2, N6, the N4, the N9, that all own pieces and parts of that, and really begin to educate, champion the efforts of we really need to look at this as an ecosystem, not just a, a series of individual problems. System of systems. It, yeah, is, a, so it is a system of systems, massive. for sure. Wow. Uh, so uh, one of our um, uh, Ed board members, I was asking for some questions that I might pose to you. And, and he asked this question, you know, for a non-cyber audience, which is a lot of mm -hmm. our audience, uh, it, come up with an, an analogy or maybe a couple of analogies, you know, so are we in terms of cyber capabilities in the yep. Navy right now, are we flinging balsa uh, wood I, I, gliders I, off the back of a cruiser in the 1920s? Are we developing the Norden bomb site? Are we getting carriers ready for Midway? Are we developing the first Aegis radars? Like, where are we in the movie, I guess? You are hitting all of my favorite talking points and somebody, you know, gave you the right uh, stimulants uh, to answer this question. So I, I you know, a, a few jokes. Um, you know, I failed calculus at the Naval Academy, which forced me into the history, the history department, uh, which I loved. Um, and it was interesting. I think I appreciated what I picked up there. And there's a lot of historical references for where we are now. And, and you really picked at a couple of them. I, I would argue that some of the issues that we're struggling with in 2023 are exactly the same arguments we were having in 1923. We were debating the use of the submarine. We were, we were, we were arguing over the adoption of the airplane. Um, the surface warfare community has an interesting history at that time when you know it was the time when the deck officer and the engineer were very separate communities. And we've been talking about bringing those communities together. So, so there's lots of analogies that go in there, right? We talk about, you know, the deck officer, the SWO of today that is now also, you know, has an engineering background. Right. Well, we have this whole other world that is cyber and information warfare and information technology. And that is its own community, it's its own world. 
is it some time to be think about, wow, how do I bring in those two worlds together, just like I brought deck officers and engineers together in the, in the 20s? When you talk about the airplane as a means and methods of warfare, you know, in the 1920s, we saw that as a toy. You right. know, we were just getting figuratively and literally off the ground. Yeah, you know, a, a way to see the adversary for over the horizon gunfire kind it, of thing, right? It, you know, 1921, the bombing of the Ostfriesland, which people still debate to this day whether it was a, you know, an accurate depiction of air power or it was rigged or how Billy Mitchell you know, pressed the attack to continue to drop the bombs. Yep. Um, the way we were thinking of using the submarine uh, as a as a platform to go after you know capital ships of our adversaries, and then you know overnight in the 1940s we adopted this idea of unrestricted warfare. All of those things have similar analogies to be made to what we're the way we're looking at cyber warfare. You know, is it as effective as we think it could be? Right? Is the airplane of the 20s effective? Yep. How are we going to use this new thing? How are we going to train our workforce? Um, is it going to be a core competency for the Department of the Navy? Um, and that's something that I think all the services are struggling with now. Uh, if you look at the National Defense Authorization Act, the most recent one that was just passed, uh, there's some prescriptive language in there asking the Department of Defense to reevaluate or relook at what force design is for you know, the DOD. Um, should each service contribute equally? Should there be specialities within, you know, should the Army do something a little different than the Air Force? Air Force something a little different than the Navy? Um, we're just sort of scratching the surface on that now. And I think that the way that we've initially established the cyber community, and I'm talking writ across the Department of Defense, um, in the next three to five or 10 years is gonna look very different. Uh, and, and the sort of adoption, the, the, the embracing of this as a legitimate means and methods of warfare, again, generationally, we're seeing some old guard that are having some challenges fully embracing or maybe uh, acknowledging what this could mean uh, to warfighting for a naval force moving forward. Uh, so that brings up a, a, a follow-on question, which is, um, you know, is cyber just cyber? In other words, uh, you know, does it matter across the joint force or are there specific naval cyber missions and naval cyber capabilities that we have to have forward deployed on ships, on aircraft, on submarines? either to defend our networks or to do offensive cyber capabilities. So, right? so, so it, it, in other words, can you, can you rely on a national cyber mission force or do, is it really important for a, indiv each individual service to have their own capabilities? So this, I love this question because it really talks about what we're doing right now with the, nat with the cyber mission forces, with the way the services are, are, are uh, uh, contributing forces as they should to combatant commanders. I mean, that's what we do with all of the other domains of warfare. You know, the combatant commanders are the ones who fight the wars, right. the services man, train, and equip. Um, so with that, uh, currently the way that we do that is we present most of our cyber forces to uh, Cyber Command under the under Admiral Clapperton's uh, authorities as the, as the Joint Force Headquarters Cyber, um, and that is having its, you know, that is it's going on course, course and speed. What you've seen in the last five-ish, seven-ish years is the services begin to sort of flush out what cyber means to them, and I'll loosely call it, you know, service-retained cyber forces. Okay. Um, the Army's creating organizations that would be, that would be purely uh, designed to operate, um, not necessarily outside of the authorities of the mission force, but, you know, more specifically to Navy missions. Uh, the Air Force has a construct called mission defense teams. The Marine Corps created a construct called uh, Marine Information Groups that are designed to operate at the MEF level. The Navy is in the process of working through what we're going to be calling our non-kinetic effects forces, think service retained. Outside of that, each of the services, I think, are looking at what their strengths and weaknesses are as a service. Um, the Navy, the Marine Corps, is uniquely positioned because of our expeditionary nature. You know, our loiter time with a ship or a submarine or an airplane, the fact that we are, for all practical purposes, a forward deployed on station, you know, interacting. Sometimes we've seen the, you know, the latest videos with China, you know, within close quarters to our adversaries, potential adversaries, right. uh, on a regular basis. So with that, as we begin to develop, and there's where you get into the sensitivity of the conversation, right? Um, as you develop other capabilities, some of those are going to be uniquely positioned to be on platforms based on their locality, their, their uh, vicinity with an adversary, that, that cyber tools make better sense to push them as, forward, as far forward as possible. 
I think one of the conversations that, that this brings up is the sensitivity of this conversation. Yep. Uh, and I usually, I kind of make the joke when I'm talking to industry and I say, hey, we have to get a little bit more comfortable with talking about this. Uh, because what we've said here is unclassified. We can go very deep into the conversation to get classified very quickly. Uh, and the way that I sort of talk around this is, hey, look, when we talk about the Columbia class submarine, um, you know, I don't know how deep it goes. I don't know how quiet it is. I don't know what the accuracy or the yield of its warheads are. But we talk about that platform openly all the time. Mm -hmm. We talk about the fact that we're acquiring one, right. how it's going to backfill the Ohio, to some degree what it costs, how it fits into our nuclear deterrence strategy. That is a very open and public discussion. We're never going to talk about how the new one's quieter right. or can go deeper or that, you know, that's all classified. But we understand what that means to the Navy, why the Navy does it, why the, you know, undersea warfare is a core competency of the Navy. As we begin to discuss the cyber question, what makes it interesting is it started in the intelligence community. And because of that, it's always had sort of a hushed tones around it. Sure. Uh, as it moves to become more of a traditional means and methods of warfare, I think we need to figure out how to talk about it in a more open way to discuss rules of engagement to one degree or another, use cases, uh, response options, not specifically, but you know, what are the things we would need to work in this space uh, that go well beyond zero trust as a, as a security architecture and more into the dynamic defense of our networks. So, like, damage control would be a good way to think about it. Damage control procedures to restore services or defend like we would do at sea. Yep. Uh, and I trust me, I could go on and on on this one. So uh, you've got time, both Navy and uh, and then in industry, and now back in uh, in government. I'm curious, uh, what what do you what did you observe in terms of the differences between how uh, private industry is is managing this problem set, and then how government is, and where where do the two how, where are they different? Where can they learn from each other? And uh, you know, are, are we is the government behind, or is it just operating differently because it it has to operate differently? So, I don't necessarily think the government's behind. Um, when Aaron Weiss was a CIO, he used to say, you know, and this might be more the the enterprise IT side of what we're doing that we were effectively ten years behind industry when it came to certain things, and there were some truisms to that. Yeah. Um, we saw, you know, the embracement of flank speed and the rolling out of, of Office 365 and the rapid adoption of Microsoft Defender and getting to a zero trust architecture. I think you're seeing a lot of advancements there, a lot of rapid advancements. So I believe for that particular case, the Navy might be uh, the poster child for how we adopted that kind of technology and rolled it out at speed and scale. Now, COVID helped. Yep. You know, you don't let a good crisis go to waste, right? So, so Aaron Weiss really capitalized on that when he was a CIO and really pushed uh, uh, the envelope in, in how we did that. But the Navy's got slightly a different problem, and I think industry is going to start seeing this a little bit too when it comes to the fact that, uh, you know, in, pre, in certain conditions, the military, by its nature, is a legitimate military target to our adversaries. Right. And we're going to be engaged slightly differently than maybe they would go after Target or IBM or Microsoft. When we get into certain conditions of, 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 of statecraft or the way one state wants to deal with another, hey, a lot of those industry organizations themselves might find themselves as legitimate military targets. You know, think in the 40s, you know, the ball bearing factory, right? That's a means of right. war production. That is a legitimate military target, and we are going to take actions to try to degrade that capability. Well, a lot of that stuff lives here, right? A lot of that stuff is within sort of the target uh, range, as we mentioned before, of our adversaries. I think where industry has, has you know, industry sort of responds to the market. Uh, where there are opportunities to generate revenue, industry will create a product or a service and begin to fill that void. Uh, the industry, and you know, things like cybersecurity and cyber risk, um, one of the things that industry has the advantage of is they can offset risk through insurance. You know, we don't have that luxury. Uh, you know, we can either accept the risk, mitigate the risk, there is no transfer of the risk in our world. So, so as we get more mature, uh, we have to be able to defend our systems. And again, the damage control analogy is one that, you know, if we're going to get into it in the further questions, when we were rolling out the cyberspace superiority revision of secure survive strike, the reason we came up with the strike one, or I'm sorry, correction, the, the, the survive one, was the adversary gets a vote. 
you know, zero trust is there to, you know, protect whatever we can to ensure that information or data or whatever we're trying to protect through that zero trust environment is not, you know, accessible to an adversary. So, Correct. Pause for sure. a second, because yeah. you've mentioned zero trust yeah. a few times, and for a lot of our audience, uh, including myself, sure. I, I have a little bit of understanding of what that is. Can you describe it, a little, you know, so, 20, 30 seconds on what yeah, zero trust the, means? The, the basics of zero trust is almost as the name implies, that you're going you're gonna to create an environment where you trust nothing. Okay. You know, so it, we always use a building as an analogy or this base. You know, from the moment I went through the front gate, I'm sort of trusted within the, I, I walked right into your building here, yep. right? In a zero trust environment, I would be checked at sort of every point. Ah. There, I would have to have some form of credential, some sort of validation, um, particularly if I, if I came in here and I was leaving and you gave me an issue of proceedings, somebody might, as I'm walking out, check that you gave me that issue of proceedings, ah. right? So that zero trust architecture is set up to really set up an environment where even if a piece of equipment is compromised, you know, for instance, even in this analogy, maybe you're compromised by the adversary and you're trying to feed me a piece of information. Well, somebody would check that I'm supposed to have that. You might be a compromised piece of equipment. Huh. It would still not necessarily uh, ensure that I got the information you were trying to get me. You know, that's the whole idea behind a okay. zero trust environment. Now that works in sort of a static way. It's dynamic, but we, we could get into the technical, the lands, you know, the OSI model, the OSI stack. But what zero trust doesn't protect is things like transport. It doesn't protect the connectivity from point A to point B in some instances. So if an adversary wanted to prevent me from getting information, they might go after the transport layer, okay. which they don't have the information, but I don't have it either. So they may not be able to corrupt the, the information or get into the information, but they can stop it from flowing. Potentially. Got it. So then when you get into the sort of the, that idea of survive, hey, we are going to be in a contested environment where I would say it, the adversary gets a vote. And things like connectivity, transport, the things that enable transport, like, I don't know, electricity, right? You know, if I don't have electricity, my computers don't work. Yep. So when I start thinking about degrading things that are further down the chain of what enables something to operate, fuel to ships, electricity to computers, uh, water to buildings, mm. those are all other ways to degrade my ability to operate. And we have to think about the idea of fighting hurt. How do I restore services quickly? How do I just deal with maybe I just got cases and cases of bottled water pre-positioned. Don't even have to turn the water off. I've got porta potties outside and I got water inside. You know, we're prepared to withstand a lack of water for a week, let's say. Gotcha. Um, and that mentality of some of those things live beyond technical solutions. Some of it's just again damage control on a ship. I have to train people to put the you know, to put the, the shoring up to keep the water from coming inside. There's no program that's going to solve that. It's a uh, blood, sweat, and tears sort of thing. Some of these things in this space we have to learn to deal with in that way. Gotcha. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing as principal advisor on cyber to the Department of the Navy uh, that you spend some time talking to other navies. Right? Yes, yeah. Uh, our partners and allies, and there's so much focus on partners and allies in, in every domain. Um, so how how are other navies, uh, particularly our ally, you know, the, the Royal Navy, the Australian Navy, the, the uh, Jap Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force. How are they dealing with this? And is it is it similar to the way the U.S. Navy is working? Yeah, and I, and I would say um, the Australian Navy is the obvious one right now because of things like AUKUS, AUKUS sure. right? So, so the relationship between the U.S. and Australia has never been stronger. Uh, as a side note, the current Australian Naval Attaché was a rugby sponsor when I was here at the Naval Academy ah. as, a, as a lieutenant over okay. here. So it's funny how, you know, yeah. you go forward and you, and you bounce back into each other. Uh, the Australia, and through that relationship, actually, you know, Commodore Grogan, Darren, has uh, enabled, uh, facilitated relationships that I meet their equivalent information warfare officers on their side. Uh, so as they go to um, work through their own ways, that we're going to provide connectivity with each other. Um, how they work with Admiral Clapperton to do Intense stuff that they have yep. relationships with um, because of their <laughs> geographic location you know, on the globe. They offer some unique capabilities, some unique authorities, um, and we found ways to work together. So across the spectrum of not only the kinetic way with the, uh, and all the things that would come along with that, with the, the submarine and the AUKUS, yep. there's, there's been a very tight uh, information warfare uh, cyber relationship that's existed for years, um, 
and we that's something that we continue to you know uh, uh, double down on. Cool. Uh, so here, close to us, uh, you know, about 500 yards from from here is where the you know the Navy's or the, the Naval Academy Cyber Center. Uh, in the last couple of years, it's been interesting. The uh, the Marine Corps uh, through the Naval Academy has has accessed more cy young cyber warfare officers than the Navy. Uh, the, there's an article in this June mm -hmm. issue of Proceedings about a Marine Corps hunt forward team that went to Ukraine prior to the war kicking off, helped the Ukrainians harden their uh, critical infrastructure, their, their computer systems, networks, et cetera. Uh, it seems like, uh, from my outside perspective, that the Marine Corps seems to be moving forward faster maybe than the Navy itself. What's your perspective on so, that? So, uh, in all fairness, it was there were Navy, there were sailors on that team that went forward. So I don't want the Navy getting okay, mad. Okay, so it at me wasn't they, just Marines. They, they, they weren't okay. there. Yeah, there were a okay. lot of sailors and, and Navy that participated in that hunt forward operation as well. Okay. Um, look, at, as the Department of the Navy Principal yeah. Cyber Advisor, you know it's fair because I get to I get to deal with both of the services. Um, the Marines are a very interesting organization, and I think it goes to their culture of being Marines when they're told to do something, they do it. Um, they've always had. Uh, up until very, very recently, uh, the best performance in the delivering of capability and forces to the cyber mission force. Mm. All of their teams were manned. Uh, they very, very aggressively uh, sought training for their individuals. Um, they came up with the Marine Information Group construct, you know, how cyber forces were going to support uh, at a MEF level, you know, forward deployed Marines. Now, a lot of those things are still in flux. The, the MIGs are still basically standing up. There, there's manning issues within the MIGs. Um, but one of the things that they did do, and I and I really credit uh, Lieutenant General Reynolds, and bef who was the the Deputy of Combat Information before uh, Lieutenant General Glavy, uh, who both were Mar Four Cyber Commanders, um, being followed by other, you know, uh, General Matos and General Maylock, um, General uh, Heritage, who's the Mar Four Commander now. Um, they're all very very aggressive around ensuring the Marines, you know, succeed in this mission space, and in doing so they very aggressively would come to the Naval Academy and recruit um, uh, very, very, again, very aggressively midshipmen who were going to go Marines into the cyber option. Uh, coddle, not coddle ah, would be the wrong word, I would say, uh, certainly courted into it. Yeah. Uh, I know that when Ch Lieutenant General Glavy was the commander of Mar 4 Cyber, he would bring MIDs up to Mar 4 Cyber to participate in things going on um, at Laswell Hall, which is where they operate out of Fort Meade, just a few miles from here. Yep. Um, the Navy, on the other hand, in our information warfare community, when and this gets it, you get into a lot of the politics of the Naval Academy and how the numbers have to be sort of spread across all of the all of the the service selection aviators and the pilots. And in the information warfare community, there's several disciplines within that community. Yeah. Uh, the intelligence, ones, intelligence, IP, meteorology, the, information, the, yeah, cryptologic, uh, cryptologic warfare, warfare, and the cyber warfare engineer. So I think last year it was 40 midshipmen that went information warfare in that group. I think three of them were cyber warfare engineers. Okay. But the cyber warfare engineer is not the only member of the information warfare community that does cyber. So it's not sort of it's not it's not maybe accurate or fair to say that the Marines recruited more or or selected more. What they what the Marines did do, and I have to tip my hat to them, uh, is they very publicly acknowledged those Marines that selected. Where you know, for when I was here, it was you were a Marine Air or Marine Ground, and there's lots of disciplines in both of those communities. Right. So for the Marines to come out and say there's Marine Air, Marine Ground, and Marine Cyber, albeit you know a handful, yeah, that's a huge message to the rest of the Marine Corps of how seriously they're taking this. I mean, and I think Navy followed suit. Uh, just this year, where they were a little more specific about when they when they talked about the information warfare community, which midshipmen were going into which communities, and it just wasn't, uh, hey, these midshipmen are going restricted line. Mm -hmm. No, no, these midshipmen are going information warfare, and they're going into these sub disciplines of intelligence, information uh, professional, cryptologic warfare, uh, and so there's a messaging aspect to there it. is a messaging yeah. aspect of this. Um, you know, traditionally when I was here at the Naval Academy. Uh, you were you were here to be a line officer. Sure, me too. And right. if you got hurt or colorblind, we're not going to throw you out. You know, you're, there's a place <laughs> for you, right. and you'll go to Civil Engineering Corps or Supply Corps, or Intel. Yeah. But if you're physically qualified, you're going to be a SWO or a pilot or a SEAL or a submariner. Yeah. 
Um, I think the fact that the information warfare community is now seen through a similar lens that, no, physically qualified midshipmen are eligible and can select into that community, that's a huge change. I think that was about five years ago that we started doing that. That sounds about right. Um, yep. Now, what is coming next, uh, you know, the language in this NDAA told the, the Navy to stand up a cyber-specific career path. We've got maritime cyber warfare officers. We're going to have, um, for the enlisted community, cyber warfare technicians. Um, Vice Admiral Kelly Ashback down at NAV I-4 NAV I has the rose sort of pinned to her to do that. To develop uh, that community. To develop that community. Okay. Um, I'm bullish. I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that this next year's class might have the opportunity to service select into it if they can get it sort of stood up and, and by that point. Mm. Uh, certainly the class following will have midshipmen directly access into that program. Gotcha. into that community. Gotcha. Okay. Well, uh, a follow-on for just uh, personnel issues and recruiting and retention. You know, every leader of any warfare community in any of the services right now is, is you know, saying to Congress when they testify, they're saying to the press, we're in a war for people. We're in a war for talent, right? Uh, so companies need cyber experts. Uh, other parts of the government, you know, you mentioned NSA, mm -hmm. Civilians, uh, uh, you know, three-letter agencies need cyber expertise. The services all need cyber expertise. Uh, how, what would you tell, you know, an 18, 17, 18-year-old, you know, young uh, cyber computer whiz, right? What, what, would, what would you tell them to uh, convince them to join the Navy or join the Marine Corps to get into this business, to get into this specific niche Warfare area. So there's a lot to unpack there, and I'm going to start uh, on the retention side. Okay. Or maybe the, I'll bounce around a little bit. Um, and I'm probably going to get in some trouble here, too. Okay, good. So uh, I just came from the War College where we were reviewing papers that might be submitted to proceedings, uh, and there, was a, there were several papers being reviewed talking about the information warfare community, retention, all of those things. Got it. And, you know, the typical first reaction is why we're having trouble keeping people in the communities. You know, the industry, the market's really good and the industry's paying more. There's some truth to that. Yeah. Um, I think... S similar to aviators and uh, the airline. All of it, yeah, right? right? I also think there's a little bit of an excuse in there. Um, there's also some truth to people that want to go in the cyber career path that just by the way the Navy works, you know, you're, you know, junior officer, you are kind of a hands-on sort of get your, get your hands dirty. And then as you sort of progress through the ranks, you move into more leadership roles and you're just sort of pulled out of the technical side of maybe what your job or discipline is. And you're, you know, you're very much into the management and leadership side of the job. That's also, you know, a concern. Meaning that some people who are experts like to keep their hands in the system. Want to stay on keyboard. Got it. Right. Yep. Uh, you know, the aviation community is an example that at least allows an officer to be flying for, you know, many, many years. Right. Uh, you know, if you're coming into the Navy, if you're coming into any of the services, an officer, you know, leadership is kind of what we're expecting. We're expecting you to be a leader. So there is some, hey, you got to deal with a little bit of the way the Navy works because there is sort of a progression. We're expecting you to, to understand a domain or a discipline and then be able to manage and then to, to lead those organizations. There is a demand signal in the, the commercial. The commercial world is looking for the, the types of individuals who are training in this, and yes, that you can make a few more bucks on the outside. Yeah. But there's lots of jobs in the Navy, the Marine Corps, that have similar counterparts in the civilian world that potentially pay more, but for some reason, you can keep a sailor or a Marine in the Navy or for 30 years doing something they could probably make more money on on the outside. Mm. You know, any surface warfare officer who spends 20 years in the Navy could make more money outside as a general manager but for some reason, there's, they're drawn to go to sea. They're drawn to being on ships. Here's where I'm going to get a little bit of trouble. Those mission sets are also clearly identified as core competencies of the Naval Service. Pilot, surface warfare, submarine, and the Marine Corps, Marine Air, Marine Ground, uh, logisticians. Those yep. things are core competencies. And there's no argument on my part that, that we should change any of that. The real question that I think the Navy needs to come to terms with is, is cyber going to be seen as as much of a core competency as some of these other disciplines? Now, I think that's a fair question to ask, and I think it's a fair question to ruminate over. Because once we begin to sort of fully vest into this community, 
there's a value proposition that that sailor or Marine is going to feel internally and want to stick with it. You know, if leadership believes in it, leadership will push forward. There's, a, there's an interesting scene. Uh, somebody turned me on to the 1955 Billy Mitchell, court marshaling of Billy Mitchell movie that I didn't know was the thing. Gregory, Gregory Peck plays Billy Mitchell in the movie. And there's an interesting scene when they're struggling through sort of the adoption of the airplane and Billy Mitchell sort of challenging the, the, the general staff of the Army of how we're going to be going through these things. And there's a scene where he walks out into the parking lot and there's 15 or 20 young captains all getting ready to turn in their, their letters of resignation. And their question is, because we can't see a future in it. You know, is the Army going to embrace us? Do we have a, right. do we have a future in it? And I think that's something that, that, is a, that, once again, is a fair question to ask of anybody because if you do want to be a cyber operator in, the, in uniform, there are some places where it's being braced a little more strongly Culturally, the Army is a perfect example. I think the Army is doing a phenomenal job in, in adopting and embracing cyber as a means and methods of warfare, uh, doctrinally, uh, career-wise, center of excellence, Army Cyber Institute. Um, they're, they're really, I think, have sort of set the standard for what this is. Um, now, as I'm saying, can the Navy can't get there? Not at all. Um, because I think, once again, I'm gonna go back to as we were talking about earlier, the things that the Navy is uniquely positioned to go do, and how do we double down on that? And once those capabilities begin to come into fruition, the, the non-kinetic effects teams, I think, is the beginning of that. Here is now a career path. Hey, you are need. It's not just we're trying to figure out how to put you at sea. You are needed at sea. It is the it is the way we are going to pre, uh, uh, maybe want to engage our adversaries initially, as opposed to going to kinetic warfare. The Navy, the Navy might be a little bit behind in this. Yep. Uh, but I think once it once it turns on, it's going to turn on fast because the value proposition to the Navy. I think is going to begin to get realized, and then it, you know, the the firing gun will go, and we will go all in on this. Okay. Uh, editorial aside, <laughs> I, I, one of the things that you didn't mention it, but I think I, I, I saw the elephant in the room, and I've heard this. Um, you know, there's been a few evolutions in in a row now where senior information warfare community jobs have gone to non-IWC officers, right? So 10th Fleet a couple times in a row now, and up now the N2, N6, not IWC officers. And so that's where the lieutenants, lieutenant commanders look at that and they say, is this a future for me? Or, or at senior levels, do these jobs just go to other flag communities? So that's, you know, I don't have an answer to that and I'm not making a, I'm not, putting a stake in the ground, but I do know that that is, that's a thing, right? It's, yeah, and it's an, look, it's and, an and, issue. And it's, it's, it's an observable, right? Yep. There's no question uh, the last two fleet cyber commanders, uh, Admiral Myers and Admiral Clapperton, have both come to the aviation community. They both came from tours at U.S. Cyber Command, Yep. right? Uh, I talk to Admiral Clapperton all the time. Um, he is all in on this, right? I'm a big fan of Admiral Clapperton, uh, particularly uh, because he really can, he really does see the world through the lens of a war fighting discipline. And that is something that I admit that the, that the line community has brought to this mission space. Um, the information warfare community, we're, all, we're, we're technically specialists in our own individual you know, intelligence, information professional. Um, and as they begin themselves to recognize their role in this domain as a warfighting community, uh, I'm very optimistic, bullish even, uh, that there are junior officers in that community that are going to be clawing for this, you know, they're going to go to do the right jobs and, and get integrated with the right things and, and take on the right mindset that this is warfare. And I'm going to think it like that. I'm not just an enabler to another warfighting community. Gotcha. Uh, again, this is not a knock well, on the a, aviators. I think that's yeah. a very good point. You, you've got to grow that. You've got right? to grow that. Yeah. So, and I think what you're going to see is over the next maybe five-ish years, yeah, there's a little clash of civilization, right? There is a little, hey, it's a fleet command and fleet commander or, or fleet organizations and there are warfighting functions and you have to have, be a leader and have a warfighting attitude to go there. That's true. Yep. There's no arguing that. Right. Um, but it's not to say that there's not uh, very capable, credible, uh, like-minded individuals that, have, that will gain a similar level of experience in the information warfare community that will ultimately matriculate into that into those positions. That will have had command and then major command and then flag level command and, and move up through that. Correct. That's, that's a, a really good point. Well, we are unfortunately out of time. This I could go on for a, another half yeah. hour or 40 minutes. This has been fascinating. 
Uh, my guest has been Chris Cleary. He is the principal advisor to the Department of the Navy on cyber. Uh, thank you for stopping by today. It's been great to have you on the show, and uh, you know maybe we'll get you back in a year and just see where we are. No, at, the, at the next issue, when the next information warfare issue comes out, I'd be happy to come back. That'd be fantastic. Well, uh, this episode has been brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. As I said at the start of the show, since 1873, our members have fostered the free and open debate that has moved the sea services forward. To become a member, go to usni.org slash join. And if you're already a member, invite a friend to join. And until next week, remember, Victory begins at the Naval Institute.